Greetings, dear children of the living God. Welcome to this episode, my dear friends, where we are enjoying the revelation of Jesus Christ through the prophet who he chose to be the last prophet before he returns to take us home. Ellen G. White, through the spirit of prophecy, as we look at the, great, what, the greatest book that Ellen White recommended herself because these visions were given to her about the the history of how God's children went through and how they were persecuted, how they conquered, and how the word conquered. The word never died. The word never died and it will never die. Because the word is Jesus Christ. The word is Jesus Christ. The word never died. So today we're going to continue our journey in the great controversy. We're going to look at a chapter where we're talking about a great man by the name of Dr. Martin Luther. Dr. Martin Luther. So today we're going to look at Martin Luther withdraws from Catholic deception after realizing that the Pope is the Antichrist. This is going to be very interesting, my dear friends. But let's begin with a word of prayer so that we can invite the Holy Spirit to guide us through. Let us pray. Mighty Father, Lord, we humble ourselves at your feet. We are just simple humans. We are not superior beings, but we are just simple humans who have decided to recognize that we can be used by thee, who have decided to love thee, Lord. I'm just a simple person. I'm humbling myself at your feet, Lord, so that you use me as your instrument. Your children who have spared precious time to listen and to learn about your word, give them your word, mighty, mighty Father, so that you remember when the sealing time comes to seal them, Lord. Let them be among the 144,000 who are going to be sealed. That is our rally, Lord. We have a great work to do, but Lord, without your help, we can't do nothing. But with little numbers, you multiply and you persevere and you conquer. You always win. We pray, Lord, that we be part of those soldiers who are going to do this work, great work for you. Bless the listeners and the watchers. Let the Holy Spirit guide them throughout so that they can concentrate without demonic attacks and disturbances along the way. We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Pour it upon us, mighty God. Have mercy on your children. Give them one more day, Lord, before you close the judgment books because we know you're about to close them. In the dearest name of Jesus Christ, we will always pray our only Lord and Savior. Amen. My dear friends, uh, before we go into deep, 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 uh, analysis of this great man who is really making my blood feel, you know. All of them are great men. We started with John Wycliffe. We came to John Haas. We came to Jeremy. Now we're dealing with Dr. Martin Luther. Who is Dr. Martin Luther? It's like, uh, almost everybody knows about Martin Luther. So you're now going to know him accordingly to the way he's supposed to be known. Because this thing of just, I know, I know, I know, I know this. I, you just know things. You don't even know things. It's dangerous. But what is the Antichrist up to? Let us uh, feed ourselves a little bit with an update. It's, it's been a while since we updated ourselves on the Antichrist happenings. Okay, you can, you can see here uh, that the Antichrist is going to attack, is going to attack, uh, is go the devil is going to bring wars. The Bible says there will be wars and rumors of wars. And we're all going to be affected. The devil is also going to bring famine, diseases like pestilences. These are written in the Bible. The devil is going to bring hunger and poverty. So when we come to the economic side of the story, I'm a professional economics. By profession, I'm an economist. So when we come to the economic side of the story, we have what we call the economic cycle, my dear friends. So the economic cycle is always having the booms and the the trials, the booms and the trials, the booms and the trials, the booms. So uh, when it's down there, it's called a recession. When it's up there, it's called a peak or a boom. So now, according to CNN here, you can see what CNN is reporting here. It's saying a major recession is coming. A major, not that one which was in uh, 2008. No, 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 no. The world, the global world crisis. No, 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 no. Now we're going to have a real major global recession. But now when there's a global recession, it means that every country is going to feel the pinch. According to economics theory, every country is going to feel the pinch. Remember what happened in 2008 because of America? Every, the whole world was affected. Just a, a country called America. But this time, this thing is coming from Europe. It's also going to come from America. It's going to come from China. 
it's going to be a major global recession. And Deutsche Bank here, which is the, the, the big bank in, uh, in Europe, one of the biggest banks in the world are actually is top five, or if it's not top five, it's on the top 10. Because I, I, last time I checked, Japanese banks were also there. Amer the, uh, the American banks are there, but Deutsche Bank is one of the biggest banks. What is this report? This report is by Matt Engineer, CNN Business. Okay, New York Business Deutsche Bank raised eyebrows earlier this month by becoming the first major bank to forecast a US recession. You see, and, and, and when it starts from USA, there is no excuse, my dear friends, it spills over to the whole world because the American dollar is the most uh, circulating currency globally. It's number one, the US dollar. Okay, so now it's warning of a deeper downturn caused by the Federal Reserve quest to knock down stubbornly high inflation. Okay. Uh, we will get a major recession, Deutsche Bank economists write in a report to clients on Tuesday. You know, clients need these reports because clients are the shareholders. So shareholders always are briefed on the happenings, the forecasts and, and, and how uh, the, economic trends, the economic trends are moving. Now, the problem, according to the bank, is that while inflation may be peaking, it will take a long time before it gets back down to the Fed's goal of 2%. So the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank of America, which is their central bank, is, uh, you see, the central bank sets goals, targets, economic goals and targets. So one of those economic goals and targets in economics, we call them uh, inflation. Okay, there's inflation, there's deflation, there's... Uh, money stock and interest rates and all those things those are economic targets so now they want the inflation to come down to two percent this side that suggests the central bank will raise interest rates so aggressively so when you when 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 you target that inflate uh, inflation rates should come down inflation rates should come down uh, basically the interest rates that are going to rise are the 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 lending interest rates the lending interest rates so when you raise the lending interest rates it means that you're going to discourage borrowing and then when you discourage borrowing you're going to try to reduce the money stock in the economy circulation when you reduce the money stock then the inflation comes down so this this, this kind of approach is not really uh, we don't promote such kind of approaches in economics because these are artificial ways of trying to control the economy. So when a Fed, like the big, the biggest Fed, the, the big central bank of the USA does such kind of an, uh, apply such kind of an approach, it means they are desperate. Now, what is leading them to desperacy? Because you see, things like inflation are supposed to be just controlled by the simple laws of demand and supply. You don't touch the interest rates because those are dictatorial now approaches when you now start commanding the banks the commercial banks in the united states hey you guys interest rates should be raised interest rates should should be raised you are now commanding them that and, and they want to do it aggressively according to this report now that it hurts it, it will really hurt the economy we regard it as highly likely that the fed will have to step on the brakes even more firmly and a deep recession will be needed to bring inflation to heal. So uh, you, you, you bring an, a recession in the economy uh, because you want to heal inflation. That is not a, a good approach. That's a desperate approach. I am telling you as an economist, that's a desperate approach. When you want to bring inflation down, you have to increase production. The healthy approaches of controlling inflation my dear friends which we learn in economics i've taught you guys inflation for years some of you who are watching me i know you my students the the healthy ways of of controlling inflation are to uh, improve the production sector and, and and export more and then produce more and then you find out that the economy grows when the economy grows inflation is controlled in a healthy way the supply side and the demand side, supply inflation, demand cause. The, the, the causes of inflation should be on supply and demand of commodities, not on interest rates. Those are artificial controls. 
because those are dictatorial. So the Deutsche Bank has noticed that and they are seeing that this is going to really, really hurt the economy. Deutsche Bank economists wrote in its report with uh, the ominous title, why the coming recession will be worse than expected. Okay, behind the curve, co uh, consumer prices spiked by 8.5% in March, the fastest pace in 40 years, you see that? So consumer prices went high from nowhere. This has been the fastest. This, so this is, in short, is historical, my friends, and it's dangerous and bad. You can't have something that has never happened in 40 years to happen all of a sudden. So inflation went up when they say consumer prices, they mean inflation went up by 8.5%. 8 the jobs market remains on fire with Moody's analysts, you know, Moody's analysts, these are one of the top analysts, projecting that the unemployment rate will soon fall to the lowest level since the early 1950s. So this is a record. This is history in the making, but this is the last history we're going to have on this earth. To make its case, Deutsche Bank created an index that tracks the distance between inflation and unemployment over the past 60 years. And the Fed's stated goals for these mat uh, me metrics uh, okay, the, the, the Deutsche Bank is trying to analyze that. That research, according to the bank, finds that the Fed today is much further behind the curve uh, than it has been since the early 1980s, uh, a period when extremely high inflation forced the central bank to raise interest rates uh, to record highs. Okay, so this thing has happened way back. History shows that the Fed has never been able to correct even smaller overshoots of inflation and employment. But this time they want to make miracles without pushing the economy into a significant recession. That's why in the beginning I told you when you want to do this method, it's because of desperacy. Deutsche Bank said Morgan Stanley warns the potential bear market in U.S. stocks. Now, bear markets are the opposite of bull markets. You know that bull markets are when markets are really, really active and they are they are uh, uh growing okay growing and favorable so bear markets is slow like like they are bearish markets everything is not the moving well accordingly those are bearish markets they are not good markets so we are anticipating a bearish market uh in the stock market in in, in the u.s stocks uh, given that the job market has over tightened by as much as two percent points of unemployment the bank said something stronger than a mild recession will be needed to do the job the good news is that the Deutsche bank sees the economy rebounding by mid 24 there is nothing like rebounding as uh, the fed reserves cause its inflation flight so these are just using now uh, the methods which we we teach and learn at, sc at school of forecasting you know the time series forecasting and all those methods of forecasting okay but when we come to spiritual the spiritual future of this world that will not going is not going to happen it's just going to go slamming slamming and recession and recession the biggest risk of global economy down there we're not going to do so much of these things but basically i've brought this to let you know that uh we are heading in a very, very big problem, my dear friends. The problem that we are heading into is very, very big because we are going to have a, a recession that this world has never... I've done my own forecasting. They are doing their forecasting because they think that there is no war that is coming. There is no world war. These things are going to balance. My friends, my forecasting is different from these economists. My forecasting is that it's going to be worse. It's going to be worse because this time I've thrown away my economic econometrics methods of forecasting. I'm using this forecasting method here. You see this one? <laughs> this forecasting method is telling us that it's not... They are seeing it, but they are, they are giving themselves hope because they are using econometrics. I am saying I'm putting away my econometrics tools and I'm using this forecasting. Things are going to be worse and worse and worse as now America is creating wars for no reason. America is even creating a big war with China. America, <laughs> America is thinking that Russia is not enough. It needs to fight both Russia and China. Biden has come to finish the game. And those of you who are blind, too blind to see these things and still giving yourselves hope, you are, you, are, you, are, you are lost, my friends, and you'll be caught unaware. You'll be caught unaware. 
So now this is the update when it comes to the economy. The economy is going into a recession, a global recession. When it happens in the States, it happens in Europe, it happens everywhere because those are the first world countries and Zambia and Africa and other, other third world countries, Jamaica and all these, these countries are going to face it rough, Madagascar and all, that, all, all the like. Okay, because we're just recipients of what happens there. So if there's a recession there, if there's a recession here, there's starvation and death. If there's, if there's, a, uh, the, the, if there's a peak there, the economy is doing well, they boom, then also here, the, 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 the recipients of whatever happens there are, are, is us. Now, my dear friends, as we go deeper into a very, very serious topic that will strengthen our faith, which is dealing with uh, a very, very big legend in our line of study, my dear friends, Martin Luther. Let us begin with our statement of truth. There is only one truth, which is the light and not the darkness, my dear friends. And that truth cannot be married to any error or any darkness. Just like you can't put a little poison in a delicious meal and say that it's still okay and safe to eat, my dear friends. Therefore, any error mixed with truth becomes poison and ceases to be truth. You can't. You can't put a little, a little poison in, in, in faith in the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy as the present truth, my dear friends. And God's Ten Commandments is the only truth. Hence, the choice is entirely ours to either accept or reject the truth. Let us start with Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. What does it say? Blessed are those, my dear friends. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 says, Blessed are those... Uh, that blessed are those who are persecuted. Uh, I would love to read it from the King James here. Blessed are they, Matthew 5 verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, okay, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Today, my dear friends, we continue our journey. We continue our journey through history of God's faithful servants after the death of Jesus Christ till the second coming, which is very, very soon, my dear friends. Probably in a few months from now or just a little years from now, Jesus will come from heaven. But after a lot of disappointments and drama and persecutions and tribulations have taken place. Today we move to the next pioneer, my dear friends, who, ref who refused the false doctrines of blasphemy of the Roman Catholic Church. He identified that the Pope was sitting on the seat of the dragon and that he was the Antichrist himself. Martin Luther, my dear friends, was born uh, in November. I was also born in November. That's why I love this man. One of the reasons. Ten, but he was born on the 10th of November, 1483. And he died on February 18, 1546. The books of history have this servant of God. And the spirit of prophecy highlights also this child of God as a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for most among those, my dear friends, who were called to lead the church from the darkness of popery of Mr. Pope into the light of a purer faith stood Martin Luther. He was zealous, ardent, and devoted, knowing no fear but the fear of the Lord and God himself, and acknowledging no foundation for religious faith but the Holy Scriptures. Martin Luther, my dear friends, was the man for his time. Through him, God accomplished a great work, my dear friends, a great work for the reformation of the church and the enlightenment of the world. Okay, now according to Great, uh, great Controversy, where we're going to get everything word by word talking about him like the first heralds of the gospel my dear friends luther sprang from the ranks of poverty you see remember most of them come from humble beginnings there is a relationship between humble beginnings and success in our line of spiritual line his early years were spent my dear friends in the humble home of a german peasant by daily toil uh, as a miner, his father earned the means for his education. He intended him for a lawyer, but God proposed to make him a builder. 
in a great temple that was rising so slowly through the centuries, hardship, privation, and severe discipline, my dear friends, where the school in which infinite wisdom prepared Martin Luther for the important mission of his life, okay, of his life. Luther's father was a man of strong and active mind and great force of character. He was honest, resolute, and straightforward, you know. He was a true, he was true to his convictions of duty. The father of Martin Luther let the consequences be what they might. His teaching, uh, his telling good sense led him to regard the monastic system with distrust, you know. He was highly displeased with Luther. He was highly displeased with Luther without his consent entered the monastery. And it was two years before the father was reconciled to his son and even then his opinions remained the same. So he was not happy when Luther did that. Luther, Luther's parents bestowed great care upon the education and training of their children. They endeavored to instruct them in the knowledge of God, my dear friends, and the practice of Christian virtues. The father's prayer often ascended in the hearing of his son that the child might remember the name of the Lord one day aid in the advancement of his truth, of the Lord's truth. Every advantage for moral or intellectual culture with their life of toil permitted them to enjoy uh, was eagerly improved by these parents. So again, parents, I have a word for you. You really, really play a big role. The future of your children basically is guided and directed by you, the parents. God has really given you parents a very, very serious responsibility. But you ignore this is responsibility. You are reckless. You drink alcohol like mad people. You smoke like mad people. You eat like mad people. You behave. You fight. You just behave like animals. But you are parenting children of God. So... We have an example here of good parents of Martin Luther. Their efforts were earnest and persevering to prepare their children for a life of piety and self and, and usefulness. Uh, with their firmness and strength of character, they sometimes exercised too great uh, se severity. But the reformer himself, though uh, conscious that in some respects, they had erred, found in their discipline more to approve than to condemn. So sometimes these guys could, the parents of Martin Luther could be a little bit rough, but it was a way of correcting their children. At school, where he was sent at an early age, that is Luther, Luther tre uh, treated with harshness and even violence. So, so great was the poverty of his parents now that upon going from home to school, uh, in another town, he was for a time obliged to obtain his food by singing from door to door. Can you imagine how Luther, uh, Martin Luther uh, suffered? You know, he has to sing now from door to door. And he often suffered from hunger. The gloomy, superstitious ideas of religion then prevailing filled him with fear. He would lie down at night, my dear friends, with a sorrowful heart, looking forward with trembling to the dark future and in constant terror at the thought of God as a stern, you know, unrelenting judge, a cruel tyrant rather than a kind heavenly father. So because of the troubles this young man was going through, he would say, ah, is there a God really? And you know, there are a lot of people who are in that state. I'm telling you, there are a lot of our dear beloved brethren out there who are homeless, people who are starving. If he has a home, it's just a little shack and he's really, really saying, ah, God is not there. Those are the people actually I'm interested in. Because you, you, the rich ones, you, the comfortable ones, you, are, you have denied it. Those are the people who are going to fill up the 144,000 the, the team that we are, we are making. Those are the people. Now, because they have even given up to say that ah, there is no God, I can't be suffering like this. Yet, under so many and so great discouragements, Luther pressed res uh, reso uh, resolutely, uh, resolutely forward toward the high standard of moral and intellectual excellence which attracted his soul.
He thirsted for knowledge, and the earnest and practical character of his mind led him to desire the solid and useful rather than the showy and superficial. So he, he now started using that suffering as an advantage to make him progress. When at the age of 18, he entered the University of Effort, his situation was more favorable and his prospects were brighter than in his earlier years. So at university, at least now, it was a little bit better than his earlier years where he used to. You know, as a young man, maybe he's 15 years old, he goes door to door singing. That was even worse than uh, the university years. His parents having the, by thrift uh, and industry acquired a competence, uh, they were able to render him all needed assistance. So there was a little bit of at least like a, 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 like a little bit of financial yeah, improvement. And the influence of judicious friends had somewhat lessened the gloomy efforts of his former training. Okay, he applied himself, my dear friends, to the study of the best auth authors, you see. So now he started studying those best authors uh, diligently treasuring their most weighty thoughts and making the wisdom of the wise his own so he was getting wisdom for some when those people who read a lot of books have wisdom i mean have got knowledge i want to call it knowledge but you can also get some wisdom if you find a man who was writing some wise words even under the harsh discipline my dear friends of his former instructors he had early given promise of distinction and with favorable influences his mind rapidly developed an an, 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 uh, uh, a, a retentive memory a lively imagination a strong reasoning and strong reasoning powers and an and, and tiring application soon placed him in the foremost foremost rank among his associates so now he was ex ex excelling in amongst his associates he was he was getting higher grades intellectual discipline uh, ripened his understanding and aroused an activity of mind and uh, a keenness of perception that were preparing him for the conflicts of his life. So you see, Ellen White is, is he, all these guys, Ellen White was shown how they were growing up, how they were growing up, how they were growing up. And that growing up is very important for every human being. People are what they are today because of the nonsense of their parents. If your parents loved money so much above all things, that is the disease you might be carrying. Evaluate yourself. If your parents loved money more than anything else, they worshipped money. The, your parents are the cause to the disease that you are having. And that disease that you are having might lead you to hell. So you need to know your diseases. Study the 40 parts of your parents and then work on those weaknesses. Okay. The fear of the Lord dwelt in the heart of Luther, my dear friends, enabling him to maintain his steadfastness of purpose and, and leading him to deep humility before God. Before God. So uh, Luther started fear. The fear of the Lord was taking him towards the right direction. He had an abiding sense of his dependence upon divine aid divine aid and he did not fail to begin each day with a prayer some of you never pray even when you're beginning your days okay while his heart was continually breathing a petition for guidance and support to pray well he often said is the better half of study wow that was great while while one day my dear friends examining the books in the library of the university luther discovered a latin bible so now he's in the library there at the university then he finds a bible the game begins the game begins okay but he's in a catholic uh, university okay such a book he had never before seen he was ignorant even of its existence he he had heard portions of the Gospels, you know, they, he heard there are they, they, they some epistles, he just heard portions which were read to the people at public worship and, and he supposed that these were the entire Bible. Now for the first time, he looked upon the whole 
all of God's word. For the first time, he found a full Bible, a complete Bible. With, ming with mingled owl and wonder, he turned the sacred pages. Yeah, what? What is... What? He, he, he's in the library now, Martin Luther now at a university. He's just Catholic. He doesn't know anything. He finds a Bible and he started going through the pages and it was in Latin. Okay. With with quickened pause and throbbing heart, he read for himself the words of life, pausing now and then to exclaim, Oh, that God would give me such a book for myself. He started saying, I wish I had this book, not in this library, but for myself. Angels of heaven were by his side and the rays of light from the throne of God revealed the treasures of truth to his understanding, my dear friends. He had, he had ever feared to offend God but now the deep conviction of his condition as a sinner took hold upon him as never before an earnest desire my dear friends to be free from sin and to find peace with God led him at last to enter a cloister and devote himself to a monastic life so now he said ah, let me go and see. Let's see, let me go into a monastic life because this God is interesting. Here he was required to perform the lowest drudgery, drudgery and to beg from house to house. He was at the age, he was at an age when respect and appreciation are most eagerly craved. Uh, and these menial offices were deeply mortifying to his natural feelings. But he patiently endured this humiliation, believing that it was necessary because of his sins. So he was there now humbling himself because he knows that uh, he was in a society of people who believe to be proud and, and they, 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 they envy to be proud. And him was in a behavior which was humbling him. Every moment that could be spared from his daily duties, he employed in study, robbing himself of sleep and grudging even the time spent at his scanty meals. So I know people, I know somebody who was waking up at 02 all the way up to 04 every day. Every day. I kept this gentleman and I know he's going to watch this video in my house for seven months. You see, again, seven is a very unique number. This gentleman, when during the whole of these seven months, we used to debate on Ellen G. White's books. I used to curse Ellen G. White. I was lost. God sent an angel in my house and he stayed for seven months. When he left, he went to Dubai. And he's in Dubai. As I'm shooting this video, I've not been in contact with him, but I'm going to contact him because I'm going to tell him you were an angel who was sent. He was rebuking me. I rebuke Ellen White. I curse Ellen White. He rebukes me. And he never stopped for all the seven months. For all the seven months. Most of the people who are watching this who are close to me, you know who I'm talking about. But you just didn't know. I think some of you could even hear us debating and quarreling over, over Ellen White. I, he was a visitor, a guest in my house. <laughs> I was a guest. The time COVID came through, that was 2019, and then he was stuck because he, would, he couldn't fly out. So he was stuck. And it was Ellen White, Ellen White. Ellen White, I'm against his four. He could wake up at 02. He's a researcher. He's a consultant. He's with an American international company, so he's always flying all over, trying to make big deals for, big for, for investors and big banks. So I kept this gentleman, and it was... He was, he was waking up, reading Ellen White's books, but he started that system way back when he was in East Africa. So, so he told me about the system of Ellen White, and I was always, because I never knew Ellen White, and I hated her without knowing her. You see, this system of hating people without knowing people, <laughs> it's going to take people to hell. I'm telling you, it's going to take people to hell. All right. So for 43 years, I hated Ellen G. White. I hated Ellen G. White for no reason, and yet my own father had Ellen G. White books in my house, in our home, as we were growing up. My own father. And he died and left a full library of Ellen White, and people have never dared to read those books. And I was one of the people who hated her for no reason, just because of some professor in, in East Africa when I was in university some 15 years ago who who will mislead all the theology students. 
and, and told them to hate LNG White. So us, even if we're in economics, school of economics, we just also heard the rumor and then we said, oh, let's, let's hate her because we trust the professor. He can't be wrong. Trusting a human being is what is going to lead most of the SDAs to hell. I'm telling you as an experienced SDA and SDA who has been for 43 years hating somebody who, des who is a savior, somebody who God pulled to the sanctuary of heaven and showed her the future <laughs> and showed her the method of going to heaven, the method of getting sealed. I hated her for no reason. And I know as you're watching me, you hate people like us for no reason again. It's the devil who, may, who brings that no reason into your brain, into your skull. The devil brings the no reason. He brought it in my skull. God sent an angel who stayed for seven months. At the end of the seven months, that man went away. But I need to communicate to him, to tell him that now God revealed to me that I was, I was insulting and rejecting the truth. I need to communicate to him. I'll, I'll, I'll write an email to him. Okay. Now, every moment could be spared from his daily duties he employed in study. You need to study, my dear friends. Study the Bible. You should also have the spirit of prophecy with you. Two books. This one explains what is the prophecy that he was revealed to this prophet. You should do that. And you will be talking on the same page. Because we are not on the same language. Most of the, the critics out there, the scoffers, we are not on the same page. We are going to only be on the same page if you do what, if, if, you, if you open up, if, you, if the light comes to you. You open up, you start loving LNG White. We'll be on the same page. All right. So I pray for that to happen quickly because time is running out. There's no time. Uh, robbing himself of sleep and that was now Martin Luther. I am, I'm explaining this because the legend, our legend Martin Luther went through that. He devoted himself to study. When you don't look for knowledge, you will die because of lack of knowledge. You just bubble, 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 bubble. You don't even have knowledge. You're going to die. You're going to be on this side. You are just lazy. You don't want knowledge. The right knowledge. You don't want it. Okay? Robbing himself to, of sleep and grudging even, even the time spent in his canteen meals. Okay? Now, Above everything else, he delighted in the study of God's word. He had found a Bible chained in the convent wall, and to this he often repaired. Okay, as his convictions, my dear friends, of deep, uh, of sin deepened. And the more you read the Bible, the more you see that you are a sinner. He sought by his own works to obtain pardon and peace because that was the catholic teaching he led a most rigorous life endeavoring by fasting vigils and scourgings to sub subdue the evils of his nature from which the monastic life had brought no release so he was still deceived because he was following some catholic ways he shrank from no sacrifice by which he might attain to that purity of heart which would enable him to stand approved before the almighty god i was indeed a pious monk he afterwards said you know a catholic monk and followed the rules of my order more strictly than i can express if ever monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works i should certainly have been entitled to it okay if it had continued much longer i should have carried my mortifications even to death so he's saying i was a serious monk and i was seriously deceived and i was gone <laughs> i was even going to die as a monk these people are deceived to death okay as a result of this painful discipline my dear friends he lost strength and suffered from fainting uh, spasms from the effects of which he never fully recovered but with all his efforts his burdened soul found no relief you see all your efforts you will never, will never give you relief you'll just be stressed stressed over and over and over he was at last driven to a, to the verge of despair when it appeared to Luther that he was lost, my dear friends, God raised up a friend and a helper for him. God always does that. God always does that. The, the pious stumped, uh, stumped opened the word of God to Luther's mind and bade him look away from himself, seize the contemplation of infinite punishment for the violation of God's law. Somebody now told him that, my guy, Luther, if you break God's law, you're going to be punished. Luther was, Luther was humble. 
you, when a new thing comes to your teaching, be humble. I remember in my 17 years of lecturing in my life and even, I, I used to, mostly that time when, I used to tell those adult students, you know those adult students, eh? those who go to the bank after they work, they come with their ties, you just see the colors of the ties, you, are, you work with Standard Bank, okay, you are with Barclays Bank, let us learn, I am your lecturer. You know, I had a problem with certain of those individuals. They, they come to my college, they pay me school fees, <laughs> and that time we had no elevator they had to climb using legs going up 10 floors uh, later on we had an elevator those people those people there were some of them most of them had problems compared to the youth those ones who could come during the day because after work we had classes i used to they, they, they no they used to debate with me as a lecturer how do you do that so i asked i had one question for them you see you guys you come to my college and the, in this particular class of economics i'm your lecturer and and then you you want to learn what you know i hope you get I, be attentive with what i'm saying people want to learn what they want what they know that is not called learning i used to tell them why are you paying school fees then why are you driving all the way coming here you park your vehicles outside you come you sit and i stand in front of you and you pay school fees that time they were paying 700,000, 700 kwacha for a course. That was some years back. Why, why are you spending money if you know what you have come to learn? So you cannot learn what you know. Every time when you are learning, it's painful. It's just like a child who's learning to ride a bicycle. Even when you are learning to drive a car, it's painful. So you always learn what you do not know. So you need to humble yourself. That is why heaven is only for the humble. And many will miss it because of that little secret. I had to tell you this. But Martin Luther was a humble, eager student to learn something new. Learning is painful, but the sweetness comes after you've learned it. You start enjoying. You re when I remember some years when we were learning even just to cycle, cycling, or even driving a car. It's, it's a hell. It's a hell you even want to give up. But when you finish learning, it's so sweet. Now you start enjoying the, the pleasures of driving the car or riding the bike. You enjoy the bike. You know, you feel people are like, you are balancing on two wheels. But it was painful. So that is how learning goes, my dear friends. When we bring new things to you, don't just throw them away. Try to invest your efforts. Instead, instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. So this guy now learned that, no, 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 no. I've been taught wrong, wrong disciplines. This is Martin Luther. Trust in Jesus, okay? In, in, in the righteousness of his life, the atonement of his death. Listen to the Son of God. He became man to give you the assurance of divine favor. Love him who first loved you. Thus spoke the messenger so, so, so of mercy. Somebody came to rescue Martin Luther. God sent a, a, an angel in the form of a human being, like I explained what happened to me as well. His words made a deep impression upon Luther's mind, my dear friends. After many a struggle with long-cherished errors, he was enabled to grasp the truth and peace came to his troubled soul. That was a serious testimony. Luther was ordained as a priest. He was still Catholic, okay, and was called from the cloister to a professorship in the University of Wittenberg. Uh, here he applied himself to the study of the scriptures in the original tongues, okay. So he now becomes a professor, but still at a Catholic university. He becomes a, a he, he devotes himself to study the scriptures. He goes deeper. He doesn't stop. He goes deeper. He began to lecture upon the Bible and the book of Psalms, the Gospels and the Epistles were, were opened to the understanding of crowds and delighted listeners. So he was a good lecturer. His friend and superior urged him to ascend the pulpit and to preach the word of God. The word of God. Luther hesitated. Yeah, he was not a very good preacher. Feeling himself unworthy to speak to the people in Christ's state. No, I'm me to speak in, on the place of Jesus. He started, he knew now about Jesus. It was only after a long struggle that he yielded to the solicit, soli, soli, uh, solic, 
solicitations of his friends. Already he was mighty in the scriptures and the grace of God rested upon him. His eloquence captivated, my dear friends, his hearers. The clearness and the power which he presented the truth convinced their understanding. You know, he, he, he was clear, he had power, he, he was a good presenter, and these guys were convinced. They were convinced, and his favor touched, his, he touched their hearts. Luther was still a true son of the papal church, he was still Catholic, and had not thought that he would ever be anything else. He was still convinced, I'll die Catholic, like some of you. I'm going to die Catholic no matter what. You die Catholic because this time is not the time of Luther. This time, those who are saying those words are going to die Catholic. Okay? In the providence of God, he was led to visit Rome. He pursued his journey on foot, lodging at the, monast at the monasteries on the way. You know, he went to Rome on foot and he was getting lodges. Uh, at a convenient, at, at a convent in Italy, he was filled with wonder at the wealth, magnificent and luxury that <laughs> he witnessed. So now when he reached in Italy, he said, hey, our church is rich. Our church is rich. Endowed with the princely revenue, the monks dwelt in splendid apartments, attired themselves in the richest and the most costly robes, and feasted on a sumptuous stable. They had food, pork, what, dressed like the richest men who have ever lived. With the painful misgivings, Luther contrasted this sense with the self-denial and hardship of his own life. So Luther looked at his life and said, no, 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 I've suffered in my life. And people are living such a life. His mind was becoming perplexed. At last, he beheld in the distance the seven-hilled city, my dear friends. <laughs> with deep emotion, he prostrated himself upon the earth, exclaiming, Holy Rome, I salute thee. So in a distance, how beautiful Rome is. That beautiful Rome. He entered, he entered the city, visited the churches, listened to the marvelous tales repeated by priests and monks, and performed all the ceremonies required. Everywhere, my dear friends, he looked upon scenes that filled him with astonishment and horror. You know, it was just like, this is a little heaven on earth. He saw that iniquity existed, a little heaven though it's a hell. He saw that iniquity existed among all classes of the clergy. These guys were rich and sinners. He heard indecent jokes, jokes which are not coming. You see, when a man of God is passing a joke, it should be... And men of God rarely pass jokes. It should be a joke that is holy and sweet. Now, some of you, the jokes that you pass, my dear friends, and you even make an error, you pass these jokes in church. This is same like these monks in the Catholic. And Martin Luther hated that. He saw the, the, the evilness in those jokes, you know. He heard indecent in, in jokes from prelates and was filled with horror at their awful profanity, even during the Mass, even during worship, the so-called Mass. They were having useless, sinful jokes. As he mingled with the monks and citizens, he met uh, dissipation, debauchery. Turn where he would. In the place of sanctity, he found the profanation. So it was supposed to be a church full of people who are in a holy way worshipping the living God, but he found, he found the opposite. No one can imagine, he wrote, what sins and infamous actions are committed in Rome. They must be seen and heard to be believed. So you need to go to Rome to see how those guys are blasphemous. And Martin Luther witnessed it himself. Thus, they are in the habit of saying, if there is a hell, Rome is built over it. It is an abyss whence issues every kind of sin. Rome is the real Babylon, my dear friends. And Martin Luther saw it himself. By a recent decretal, an indulgence had been promised by the Pope to all who should ascend upon their knees. Pilots staircase said uh, to have been descended by G by our savior jesus on leaving the roman judgment hall and to have been miraculously conveyed from jerusalem to rome now luther was one day devoutly climbing these steps those things they were calling uh, uh pilots what 
Pilate's staircase. You know, remember Jesus was tried and then he, he moved through some stairs. So in Rome now, they are making that. They are actually mocking Jesus, in short. Luther was one day devoutly climbing these steps when he suddenly, uh, suddenly a voice like thunder seemed to say to him, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1 verse 17. So when he was on those staircases which they believe Jesus walked on after Pilate sentenced him to death, you know, they, 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 they have those stairs there in Rome. They believe Jesus walked on the Pilate staircase. So Martin Luther was walking there. And then that's when a thunder talked to him. The just shall live by faith. Romans 1 verse 17. Okay. He sprang to his feet and hastened from the place in shame and horror. That text never lost its power upon his soul. The just shall live by faith, never left his soul. From that time, his soul, my dear friends, more deeply, more clearly than ever before, the fallacy of, the, of trusting to human works for salvation and the necessity of constant faith in the merits of Jesus Christ. So from that moment, Luther started saying that we've been misled. We are Somehow it started, it started opening in his mind that we are trusting mortal man instead of Jesus Christ. Instead of Jesus Christ. Okay? And the necessity, the necessity of constant faith in the merits of Christ. His eyes had been opened and were never again to be closed to the delusions of the papacy. When he turned his face from Rome, he had turned away also his heart. <laughs> so now his heart, my dear, God was working in this man's heart, showing him the truth and how evil and satanic Rome is. And when he turned his mind away from his beloved Rome, he now went away forever and ever. And today we have Martin Luther. Rome had turned away his heart. And from that time, separated, separation grew wider until he severed all connection with the papal church. Now he went separate. After his return from Rome, Luther received at the University of Wittenberg the degree of Doctor of Divinity. So he was given a promotion. Okay. Now he was at liberty to devote himself as never before to the scriptures that he loved. He had taken a solemn vow to study carefully and to preach with fidelity the word of God, not the sayings and the doctrines of the satanic popes. All the days of his life, he said, I'm not going to preach what the popes, though the doctrines of the popes never. Now I'm going to preach only based on the word of God. He was no longer the, the mere monk or the professor, but the authorized herald of the Bible. Now, he had been called as a shepherd to feed the flock of God that was hungering and thirsting for the truth. He firmly declared that Christians should receive no other doctrines than those which, my friends, rest on the authority of the sacred scriptures. <laughs> he now is converted. He now is touched by the Spirit because he's a humble, he was a humble man. These words struck, my dear friends, at the very foundation of papal supremacy very foundation. They contained the vital principle of the reformation. Luther saw the danger of exalting human theories above the word of God. He fearlessly attacked the, the speculative infidelity of the schoolmen and opposed the philosophy and the theology which had so long held a controlling influence upon the people. Now he started attacking them. You guys are lost. You have been lost. He denounced such studies as not only worthless but uh, pernicious and sought to turn the minds of the hearers from the sophistries of the philosophers and the theologians to the eternal truths set forth by the prophets and the apostles. <laughs> so you, by the way, this disease is not only in the Catholics. It's, I know it's bigger there. It's bigger in the Sunday churches. It's there also in the SDA. And 99% of you are in that disease. What disease am I talking about? Instead of trusting in the Bible, like Luther did, Martin Luther, you trust in the professors, the doctors. When someone stands there with a big jacket in front in the pulpit, and then, the, the, and this system, I remember when my father was still alive, he used to, when he, when he goes to church, he used to come and complain at home. We were growing up as kids some 30 years ago. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 years ago. 
Why do we have a tendency of today we have Dr. Shimojila? He has studied his doctorate degree from Andrews University, Michigan. Can we make can we clap for him in SDHH? His wife, what this, this? He's, he's, he's driving, he's just parked his car outside, it's a Range Rover. <laughs> so now, when that man stands to speak, everybody will take him as a small god. They will listen to whatever nonsense that doctor is going to speak on the pulpit. My father always told them, please don't do those introductions. Spare them for, for other people. Yes, I know I'm a doctor. I got my doctorate from Andrews University. Please don't announce that to the people. I just want to preach. And he could come complaining. When we were growing up, I remember I was in high school and all those years when we used to, we used to stay with him. So, this is where Martin Luther came to say that we have a problem in Catholicism because we just believe in philosophers and theologians to the eternal truths set forth by... Instead of listening to prophets and apostles who never had those degrees from Andrews University. Did they have this, those degrees? Did, where, where did John the Baptist get his degree? <laughs> or Jesus? Or Peter? From fishing? These were fishermen. The degree will be given to you by God. You don't need big universities to know Jesus. You don't need that. Precious was the message, my dear friends, which he bore to the eager crowds. Now that's Martin Luther that hung upon his words. Never before had such teachings fallen upon their ears. The glad tidings of a Savior's love, the assurance of pardon and peace through his atoning blood rejoiced their hearts, my dear friends, and inspired within them an immortal hope at Wittenberg. A light was kindled, my dear friends. A light was kindled whose rays should extend to the uttermost parts of the world, of the earth, and which was to increase in brightness to the close of time. Yeah, we're going to increase Luther's brightness. We are going to increase this because we are the ones in the Reformation now. We are in the revival and reformation. The protest continues of Martin Luther. It doesn't end. It's going to end when Jesus comes. I'm telling you. But light and darkness cannot harmonize between truth and error. There is an irrepressible conflict. I've been telling you, what is our definition of truth? Martin Luther is also saying it here. You can't mix light and what? Darkness. It's actually from the Bible. To uphold and defend the one is to attack the other, uh, the other side. That's why you people who are condemning us for, uh, for revealing who the Antichrist is to the children of God. You are condemning, hey, Mangwe should stop that approach. He's condemning the Pope. Which approach do you want? You are, now you, you are covering the Pope and you are claiming to be light. So you are not with us. You are not with the light. So you can't mix light with darkness. Martin Luther discovered that. He discovered that. And now he's withdrawing from the papal syndrome. You, you are going to the papal syndrome. Our Savior himself declared, I came not to send peace, but a sword. In Matthew 10, verse 34, said Luther, a few years after the opening of the Reformation, God does not guide me. He pushes me forward. He carries me away. I am not master of myself. I desire to live in repose, but I am thrown into the midst of tumults and revolutions. Now about to, he was now about to be edged into the contest. Now he was getting cooked. He was becoming a soldier, a general. Now for Christ, the Roman church had made merchandise of the grace of God. The tables of money changers. You remember these guys, even today, the richest people on earth are the Vatican. They have been gathering riches for 1,500 years and Martin Luther saw that and he remembered Matthew chapter 21 verse 12, okay, where the tables of money changers were, were encountered in that, in that situation, were set up beside her altars and the air resounded with the shouts of buyers and sellers under the plea of raising funds for the erection of St. Peter's Church in Rome. So now hey, let's raise funds so that we make that blasphemous St. Peter's uh, Cathedral theirs. Indulgences for sin were publicly offered for sale by the authority of the Pope by the price 
of crime a temple was to be built up for God's worship. So that's St. Peter's Square. This thing I'm showing you here now. This thing was created from corruption. From stealing money, these monks, remember I told you during um, who encountered monks, monks so much? Um, John Wycliffe. Monks were, John Wycliffe had, is the first one who, who condemned those monks. We are getting money from poor people, poor people making this thing called St. Peter's Square. Blasphemous. Everything about this thing is so blasphemous. Okay, by the price of crime, a temple was to be built up for God's worship. That was bad. The cornerstone laid, laid with the wages of iniquity, but the very means adopted for Rome's aggrandizement provoked the deadliest blow to her power and greatness. It was this that aroused the most determined and successful of the enemies of popery and led to the battle which shook the purple throne and jostled the triple crown upon the pontiff's head. <laughs> the official appointed the official appointed to conduct the sale of the indulgences in Germany, okay, Tez, uh, Tezel by name, had been convicted of the basest offenses against society and against the law of God. So there's a guy in Germany who was told, sell, 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 we are raising money for going to, uh, going to, 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 to make that blasphemous thing. Okay, now, but having escaped the punishment due to his crimes, he was even punished. He was, he was supposed to be punished. He was employed to further the mercenary and unscrupulous projects of the Pope. Now, you know, Pope has mercenaries, people who kill. Uh, Jesuits, those are not spiritual beings. They are just trained assassins. With great effrontery, uh, uh, he repeated the most glaring falsehoods and related marvelous tales to deceive an ignorant, cru credulous, and uh, superstitious people. So ignorant people were deceived by these pontiffs. Had they possessed the word of God, they would not have been thus deceived. So only you, when you are lazy to, to read and to watch programs and to learn, you're going to be, be deceived forever and ever. It was now, it was to keep them under the control of the papacy. In order to swell the power and wealth of her ambitions, ambitious leaders that the Bible had been withheld from them. So they hide the Bible, these popes. Have you ever seen a Bible when you go to worship at a mass? You, you don't even carry Bibles. So how are you going to, how does a lawyer go to a case in, in the courts of law without any books? How do you win a case? So as, Tez, as, as Tezel entered the town, a messenger went before him announcing, the grace of God and the Holy Father is at your gates. <laughs> and the people welcomed the blasphemous pretender as if he were God himself. Come down from heaven to them. You know, the infamous, he's now going to collect money. He's saying, I'm, I'm God coming, as if he's God coming down himself. So the infamous traffic was set up in the church and Tezel ascending the pulpit extolled the indulgence as the most precious gift of God. He declared that by virtue of his certificates of pardon of sins which the purchaser should afterward desire to commit would be forgiven to him and that not even repentance is necessary. Remember we've been talking about purchasing of sins. The Catholics, you can buy forgiveness using money. The Muslims, you can buy forgiveness of sins, even for dead people using money. That is satanic. Only Jesus can forgive your sins. More than this, he assured his, hear, his hearers that the indulgences had power to save not only the living, but also the dead. Exactly what I'm trying to explain. That the very moment the money should cling against the bottom of his chest, the soul in whose behalf it had been paid would escape from purgatory and make its way to heaven. I have talked of purgatory before. This is a very satanic thing which is believed in Muslim and in Catholicism. Now, when Simon Magus offered to purchase uh, to purchase of the apostles the power to, to work miracles, Peter answered him. Peter answered him. This problem has been condemned in the Bible. Let's, re let's read Acts uh, 8 verse 20. Acts 8 verse 20. What is it saying? When, when Simon Magus offered to purchase, my dear friends, you remember that story in the Bible of the apostles, the power to work miracles. There is, there is that story 
where this guy uh, was converted. He, uh, uh, he was a sorcerer, you know, these magicians. Then he got the word, he he's left that and joined the apostles, uh, the, well, the missionaries that time uh, during Peter's time. Then Peter came and, 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 and uh, when Peter came, he visited, uh, uh, he was trying to encourage these, these workers of faith, okay? And, and Philip was, Philip was more mature in spiritual matters compared to this gentleman, uh, Simon Magus. And so when Simon Magus saw Peter, he said, can I buy some of the power so that I can work miracles? You buy powers to work miracles. This is what Peter answered him. Peter answered him. Let, let's read it. Let's read it. Acts. Let's go to Acts. Uh, Acts 8 verse 20. Acts 8 verse 20. Okay, the, what is the Bible saying here? How did Peter, Pete, but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Your money should die with you because you think that us, we, are, we bought this, this power that we're using to, to perform miracles. We don't do that. This is not true. This is evil. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But Tezel's offer was grasped with anger, uh, with eager of thousands. Gold and silver flowed into his treasury. Now, coming back to the popes, them, they, 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 they buy everything. And uh, Tezel's offer was grasped by eager of thousands. Gold and silver flowed into his treasury. And then Dr. Martin Luther was checking out these things and comparing with the word of God. Contrary, contrary. When you go to Acts 8 verse 20, contrary, Peter rebuked this nonsense, this blasphemous behavior. You don't go to God to say, I have money, give me power to perform miracles. He actually condemned that man. He said, you are going to die with your money. A salvation that could be bought with money was more easily obtained than that which requires repentance, faith, and diligent effort. To resist and overcome sin, so the easy way is to use money, then your, your sins are forgiven. That's the easy way because people want the easy road. The doctrine of indulgence has been opposed by men of learning and piety in the Roman church. And there were many who had no faith in pretentious uh, so contrary to both the reason and revelation. Uh, no prelate dared lift his voice against the inquisitive, in, uh, iniquity, in, iniquity, iniquitous traffic from the word iniquities. But the minds of men were becoming disturbed and uneasy. And many eagered, eagerly uh, inquired if God would not work through the same instrumentality for the purification of the church. So people are like, mm, can God work like this? No, 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 no. This is Luther, though still a papist uh, of the st uh, straightest sort, was filled with horror at these blasphemous assumptions and assumptions and indulgence. Mongers, many of his own congregation had purchased certificates of pardon. They were soon be <laughs> so you have a certificate of being forgiven your sins. You bought it with money. Many of his own congregation had purchased such and soon began, began to come to their pastor confessing their various sins and expecting absolution. Now they started doing it in front of Luther, not because they were penitent and wished to reform, but you, know, you don't even want to change your life. You just want to say, let my sins be forgiven, then I continue in sin. But on the ground of the indulgence, Luther refused them absolution, you know, and warned them that unless they should repent and reform their lives, they must perish in their sins. Luther now started rebuking these people. In great perplexity, they repaired to test you. Now they went to, te to Tezel, the, the, this guy who was busy uh, blaspheming, collecting money and forgiving people's sins with the complaint that their confessor had refused his certificates. And some boldly demanded that their money be returned to them. The, the friar was filled with anger and rage. Now he uttered the most terrible, terrible curses, caused fires to be lighted in public squares, and declared that he had received an order from the Pope to burn all the heretics who presumed to oppose his most holy indulgences. This Luther is trying to bring confusion. He's bringing confusion. I have been sent by the Pope and given power that I can forgive sins and I'm giving certificates to those who are coming to buy the forgiveness of sins. But who is this Luther who is condemning 
Luther now entered the bo uh, entered boldly upon his work as a champion of the truth. Now the game is changing. It was becoming changing. Now Luther is getting out of this false system. His voice was heard from the pulpit in earnest solemn warning. He set before the people the offensive character of sin and taught them that it is impossible for man by his own works to lessen its guilt or evade its punishment. Nothing but repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ can save the sinner. That was Luther now. He is becoming a, a barrier of the light. Luther became, is becoming the barrier of the light. The grace of Jesus Christ cannot be purchased. It is a free gift. He counseled the people not to buy indulgences, but to look, to, the, to look in faith to the crucified Redeemer. He related his own painful experience in, in vainly seeking for humiliation and penance to secure salvation. So Lucifer talked about, I mean, uh, Luther talked about his life. Okay, how him himself was trying. He was misled, in short. He said, I was misled and assured his hearers that it was by looking away from himself and believing in Jesus Christ that he found peace and joy. Now, as this blasphemous guy called Tezel continued his traffic and his impious uh, uh, pretensions, Luther determined upon a more effectual protest against these crying abuses. An, an, an occasion soon offered, my dear friends, the castle church of, the, of Wittenberg, okay, uh, possessed many relics which on, on, uh, on certain holidays uh, were exhibited to the people and full remission of sins was granted to all who then visited the church and made confession. So there was, <laughs> there was even special days when, when, when now, you know, you go there with your bucket of money, you need all your, you see, you sin very, very serious sins, serious sins. And then you, you, you know that uh, I'm going to, when I harvest my maize, uh, that will be the money. I'll take it. I'll be forgiven. According on those days, the people in great numbers resorted thither. So the, the specific days, the, <laughs> you come many, many of you. One of the most important of these occasions, the festival of all saints was approaching. Catholic has really, really been satanic. On, on the preceding day, Martin Luther joining the crowds that were already making their way to the church posted on its door a paper containing 95 propositions against the doctrine of indulgences. He declared his willingness, my dear friends, to defend these theses next day at the university against all who should see fit to attack them. His propositions attracted universal attention. They were read and reread and repeated in every direction. Great excitement, my dear friends, was created in the university, and the whole city got that excitement. By these theses, it was shown that the power to grant pardon of sin and to remit its penalty had never been committed to the Pope or any other person. Luther said, no one gave Mr. Pope the power to forgive sins or any other of, his, of these monks of his. The whole scheme was a fence. <laughs> an artifice to exhort money by playing upon the superstitions of the people. So these were just crooks who were stealing money from people. A device of Satan to destroy the souls of all who should trust in its lying pretensions. It was also clearly shown that the gospel of Christ, my dear friends, is the most valuable treasure of the church and that the grace of, Jesus, of God there, therein revealed is freely bestowed upon all who seek it by repentance and faith. You know, this is from Great Controversy 130.1. My dear friends, Luther was now coming out, went and prepared the thesis, a lot of them, to say, no way can we be using this methodology to cheat people. Who told you you can purchase sins? Read Acts, Acts 8 verse 20. See how Peter rebuked that man who said, I want to buy powers so that I can also perform miracles. Who told you? The scriptures never said that Jesus gave powers to any guy called Pope to forgive sins. Today, today this Pope forgives sins. This Pope still forgives sins. You, I have been telling you, you are cheated in Zambian Catholic churches. You work hard, hard, hard. Open a savings account, fix deposit, and let your money grow. Go to Rome, visit Vatican, 
<laughs> kiss that ring of his. This system of even you who, who in SDS who are still wearing rings, you should stop it. Because you don't even know where these rings come from. Rings are coming from these characters. You kiss that ring of the Pope and then all your sins are washed away. And you pay him money. This is a blasphemous, blasphemous, I am telling you, children of God, stop it. Those of you who are in these tendencies, stop it before God curses you to the uttermost. God curses you to the uttermost. My dear friends, we are going to end it here today with Martin Luther. We are going to continue in part two as we see how Martin Luther still is getting out of this system and is rebuking it. Those of you who are getting out of these wrong systems, please don't just get out. Tell them why you are leaving Catholicism, coming to join the SDA, the Remnant Church. Tell your reverends, tell your church members, tell your friends. That is what Martin Luther did and Jesus will be happy with you. Jesus will support you and protect you all the way. Do the right thing when you have the knowledge and when Jesus gives you the wisdom. I want us to meet in the next episode as we continue looking at this very interesting reformer of Jesus Christ, a great servant of Christ, Martin Luther. Meet me in part two as we look at Martin Luther's withdrawal from Catholicism of deception after realizing that <laughs> the Pope is the Antichrist. After realizing so in part two, he's going to realize that the Pope is actually Mr. Antichrist himself. Maranatha, Jesus is coming again soonest, my dear friends. Amen. When you believe me, I will go. Trust in soul, and I remember it was for me that he was slain on Calvary. Jesus shall lead me night and day, Jesus shall lead me all the way. He is the truest friend to me, for I remember.
Me. For I remember.